had a couple of questions to start. How many people in here are looking simply to start off doing wholesaling? So about a third. How many people in here are doing fix and flips? About a third. And how many people in here are doing portfolio long-term rentals? A few. OK. So we have kind of a mix of all three. Um, how many people in the room have done more than five deals? OK. So we're definitely in the beginning of those. How many people have not done a deal ever in their life? All right, this is good statistics here. <laughs> uh, so uh, to give you all a little bit of background on me, uh, as Dustin mentioned, we have been with Atlanta Rea since they started. Uh, my business partner, Jonathan, and I started our firm in 2007. Um, we were both doing a little bit of contract real estate before we started the firm. Uh, in 07, the market was almost all uh, retail refinances and some good old purchases, and then market crashed the next year. Um, and so at that point in time, everything went REO and short sale. We had a lot of trouble even getting our clients from new closings over to us. And we said, well, who in this city is where we're going to get all of our business from. And so we said, well, we should maybe start going after cash buyers because these are the people that are controlling their own closings. Um, so we started working with investors. Um, I luckily had a friend that worked at one of the large hedge funds. Um, and so through him, he made introductions for me all the way down the line through all of the big major players, the big national guys that were coming in to all the major markets and buying thousands of homes. Um, and through that, you meet the people that sell them the houses, and then from them you meet the people that go find the houses from them, and you meet all the lenders and all the GCs and all the other vendors. And what we discovered um, was that, um, let's go to that, uh, is that it takes a very synergistic approach um, to be a good real estate investor. Um, and what that means is you need a good team of people around you. Um, as it says, the interaction or cooperation of two or more organisms, substances, or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. Meaning that you need a lot of good people surrounding you. Um, it's not just a closing attorney like myself. It's you've got Network and New Western and other great people in the room that can help you with lending, you need people that can help you with funding, particularly the wholesalers. How many people in here would, would love to be able to do a, a lot more deals if they had transactional funding and they had an unlimited amount of money to go do their deals with? Yeah. Exactly. So at the end of this, I'll give you all some cards and some people that can help go with that. But as long as the deal's there, they're good. So the, the goal of this here, um, as I said, I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, but this is a little bit more on us, but the goal here is for y'all to surround yourself with people that know what they're doing and have been in the business and work well together. Um, for us, from my side, the reason why we think that, that, that we are good to work with is because we understand sales and marketing. A lot of attorneys that you go talk to have that lawyer brain and they don't understand the investor's mentality. I'm a real estate investor myself. Um, I'm also an investor in a lot of other stuff. So. I understand when y'all are coming to us and it's your money, the difference in working as a closing attorney, the difference in working a lot of retail work um, or we're working with real estate agents and lenders, um, and we love working with them too, But and they're involved in our transactions, but they're dealing with somebody else's property um, and somebody else's money. They're like me performing a service for y'all, but for y'all, this is your money, um, and so a lot more detail wants to be paid attention to when my clients that are investors are calling me and it's one of their deals because it's not just a customer of a customer, it's their actual money. Um, and so understanding the mindset of investors and what you guys need has been very important for us. It's helped us grow our business and our whole goal is to help you grow your business. It's much easier for me to do 100 closings a month if I had five clients that were doing 20 closings a month because I only got to deal with five clients than it is for us to have 300 people that are each doing one closing a month. So our goal is to take our clients in, tutor them through the process, um, get, surround them with the right vendors um, outside of us, um, and make sure that they're getting deals. Um, the other things that we try and do, um, educational stuff like this. Um, we do a lot of lunch and learns. Uh, we do do continuing education for any of you investors that are real estate agents also. Um, and we do all of this for free. This is not something that we're, that we're looking to go make money off of. As I said, we come out here, we educate, 
Um, we do consultations for free. We really, our goal is to get y'all in business and doing business the right way. And, and we're going to go through some of the ways not to do things as well in a little bit. Um, this is a very long presentation on entities. How many people here have already formed an LLC or a corporation for their business? How many people have not done that but need to? Okay, y'all talk to me about that afterwards. We're corporate attorneys also. That really needs to be done. Um, this is like a two hour presentation on entities, so I'm not gonna go through all of it, um, but I can email this to everybody uh, if they would like the information. I'm gonna fly through some of this. Um, there are five types of entities that you guys can form. A sole proprietorship is when you and your individual name are going out and you start a business for yourself. A general partnership is when you and or two or three or 10 other people are going and forming a business together. Limited partnerships I'm not gonna go into right now because that's gonna be too confusing. A corporation is where you are forming an ink. It is very complicated legally as well as financially. Uh, you have to keep books, you have to have annual meetings, you have to have minutes. This is what everybody used to do to protect their assets. And now most people use limited liability companies or an LLC. Um, some of the advantages, I'm gonna skip through a lot of this. Y'all give me a second. <laughs> As I said, this is very good information that I can email y'all. All right, so LLCs. Guys, the good thing about LLCs is each individual state created different LLC laws um, when the LLC came about, probably in about the mid-90s or so. And the advantages of the LLC is you can structure it from an asset protection side um, in a similar way of a partnership where your, your personal assets are not going to be able to be touched. The only way that anybody can come into an LLC and touch any of your personal assets um, is if what they, it's what they call piercing the corporate veil. Basically, you would have to be committing some sort of fraud, misrepresentation, intentional misconduct, or some sort of uh, gross negligence. You'd have to be something, there's a very high bar um, for a judge to ever be able to come in and touch any of your home that you live in, your car, your boat, your bank accounts, any of that, as long as the houses that you're dealing with are protected into an LLC. Um, the advantage of that, the reason, the reason why they became so popular though versus a corporation is because you can still be taxed as a corporation. So all the tax benefits that you can get as a corporation, you have the option to be taxed as either a sole proprietor or general partnership, um, whether there's one or two of y'all, or as an escort. Um, I can get into that a little further and another time the tax implications on it. Um, another good idea for all of you if you're starting off, whether you've created your entity or not yet, um, is to get a good CPA that understands real estate, that understands real estate investments. I've got three or four that I typically refer to. I would imagine Dustin and, and some other people in here have some good real estate CPAs as well. But that is a weapon that you're going to want in your arsenal just as much as a good closing attorney or any of the other vendors that you need. Um, <laughs> So out of those, like I saw like 20 different people raise their hands that have already created any. How many of y'all did LLCs? Almost everybody. How many people created a corporation? <laughs> what, what, out of curiosity, what was the motivation to create a corporation versus an LLC? Uh, Speaking, is that what? Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, there's, there are good reasons to start a corporation. The, the negatives to a corporation for most beginning investors that aren't real capital heavy is it's, it's, it's a little bit more expensive. Every year there's going to be more legal and more accounting. Um, and that's typically why most beginning investors say let's go ahead and just do an LLC first. Um, it's a little bit more work throughout the year too. Um, real fast on the taxation stuff on limited liability. So an LLC with one member a single member is going to be disregarded. It's going to be passed through onto your personal tax return no matter what. Um, an LLC with more than one member can be taxed as a partnership unless it elects to be taxed as a corporation. So the default is if you don't, there's, there's, a, there's an IRS form that when you're filing your LLC, you don't, you, don't, you don't have to do it immediately right when you file. So if y'all haven't done this yet, don't worry, you can get this form and you can still do it. But the default is you're going to be taxed as a general partnership um, if you do not fill out this one, if you fill it out, then you can be taxed as an escort. Um, so we can, we can, when we get to the questions, I'm sure people are going to have a little bit of questions about that. Um, as long as you do it before you're filing your first year taxes, you can, you can change it over. And you can, and it's not like it's something that's permanent either. 
the next year, you can have your accountant change it over as well. It's just for that tax year. Um, if it is treated as a partnership, uh, kind of like the sole proprietorship, the earnings will be apportioned to its owners and taxed at the personal tax rates, similar to the tax treatment of a limited partnership. Let me explain what this means. This means if you make $100,000 that year and you're a sole proprietor, then that $100,000 goes straight onto your personal income taxes and you pay your total personal income tax rate, which is here, you gotta pay your state taxes, you're gonna pay all your federal taxes, you have your Social Security and Medicare up to a certain amount, so you're gonna be paying a much higher tax rate than a corporate tax rate, particularly after Trump cut corporate tax rates. If you do not remember what the rate is, but I can promise y'all it's much less, your corporate profits are much less than what your individual uh, income tax rates are. So there are also, that's one of the major advantages of being taxed as a corporation. Once again, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to create an ink anymore or a corporation. Um, you can do an LLC and get taxes and that's I am not a tax attorney. I'm gonna say that right now. So we do recommend everybody talk to the CPAs or a good tax attorney about that. Um, as I said, there is a lot of good information here. This is a chart that we've got, which goes through the difference. There, there's four main things that are involved in your decision on the entity that you're gonna form. There's the, your control over the company, uh, the liability, which I'm gonna go over in a second, uh, the tax implications, and then the administrative work. Um, liability, why is liability so important? Um, people ask this both from a, an entity perspective as well as a title insurance perspective that we're gonna to talk to in a little bit. And a lot of people ask me, uh, particularly wholesalers, when they're saying, well, I'm just, uh, I'm either gonna go um, assign a house out or I'm gonna do a double closing and I'm gonna be on title for just a couple of minutes. Um, why, should, why do I have to mess with getting an LLC and all of this? The fact is, particularly if you're doing double closings, um, and we're gonna to get to everybody else that is actually holding property for a while, um, but even for the wholesalers, Y'all don't understand that even that 10 minutes that you might own the property, if, if an issue happened and it takes five years from now and something comes backwards and it comes back to you and you weren't structured properly or you didn't get title insurance for that five minutes that, that you own the house, the liability could come back on you. Um, it doesn't matter the length of time that you own it. I'm gonna get into that a little bit more when we get to the title insurance issues. Um, but. You want to protect your personal assets. Um, has anybody here thought about using series LLCs? Do y'all even know what those are? Basically a series LLC, and these are not different in every state as well. Um, but basically it's where you get a holding company. You create an LLC that's the holding company, and then for each individual house you do, you actually put each one of those into a separate LLC. It can be as simple as uh, doing the address for each LLC, 123 Main Street LLC, or a lot of people will pick the you know, the name of their company, uh, Atlanta Commercial 1, Atlanta Commercial 2, Atlanta Commercial 3. Um, and what that does is it not only separates out your personal assets from the business assets, it separates each one of those business assets out as well. Um, particularly for the people that are doing fix and flips. You have contractors in your house. There are people standing on roofs, there are people going upstairs that could be, you know, falling apart. There's all sorts of things there's, that could happen when you're doing construction in a house. Um, and the last thing that you want is, God forbid, somebody falls off the roof and passes away and you get a wrongful death suit, it can literally take out your entire life if you have this property in your personal name. So it is one of the most important things that I tell investors is from the very, very beginning, make sure you are protecting yourself, make sure you are protecting your personal assets, make sure that you have good documentation. Okay, so through all of that, the main thing that you need um, when you are creating your entity is an operating agreement. These operating agreements are very, very important for anybody that has a business partner. Um, people might look at me and say, oh, well, it's just my wife, no big deal. It's my son, no big deal. It's my best friend I've been working with for 30 years. None of this is ever gonna happen. Those seem to be the times <laughs> where it happens. I kid you not, it's more often a spouse or a best friend that somebody's worked with um, that ends up with a business issue that they have 15 years down the line with one of their houses. You want to make sure that you are stru structuring your operating agreements correctly and that you have an attorney go through the entire thing with you and make sure that each individual section of it, you're getting done right, okay? I'm not gonna go through too much of this right now because as I said, that could be a whole separate class. 
Um, but I do want to point out, because I heard somebody else say the word joint venture earlier. Um, I use the term investor agreements in this as opposed to joint venture agreements. Um, but the structuring of a joint venture is very similar to what the structuring of an operating agreement should be for real estate investors. Um, I use a lot of the same language in it, um, depending on which kind of transaction we're doing. But uh, the difference is an operating agreement is going to go through some of the stuff that like your entire company is going to run off of for years and years and years. Whereas an investor agreement is just going to define the terms of the, if you want to call it a joint venture. Um, of the business partners that are doing this particular deal together. Now, what happens is a lot of time people do these separate LLCs for property, so your operating agreement in turn ends up just looking like an investor agreement because you're basically setting out all the rules for this particular property. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, hold on. Okay. So I wanted to talk about similarities and differences between these documents. Um, your operating agreement and an investor agreement are going to contain all of the general information that you need. This information is important for the closing attorneys. So when you guys are starting your businesses, if you are doing them yourself, and, and the Secretary of State's website has made it very easy for you guys to do your LLCs yourself. Get online, you pay a couple hundred bucks to file it, and you file it online with a transmittal form. Here's the problem, and a lot of people don't understand this, that if you file your articles of organization online on the Secretary of State's website, it does not establish ownership in any individual. Uh, there's a word on there that says organizer's name, that is not the owner's name. I could be, if we were doing your LLC for you, my name is actually the organizer, it's not the owner. So what happens is, is y'all create your LLC and you get your articles and your transmittal from the Secretary of State's website and all it has on there, if you are not creating your articles and filing them, if you're just filling in what's online, there's no ownership on there. There's no signatory authority. The contract that you probably already signed before you send it over to the closing attorney with him asking for your operating agreement, you actually weren't even legally allowed to sign that contract. It wasn't even valid yet until you have at least articles of organization establishing who the members are or, or a better option would be for you to have a full operating agreement establishing signatory authority. So the problem is, this is the first little look out for this ahead of time, is I cannot tell you how many times we get a new investor's company that's sent over to us with a contract. We ask them for their articles and operating agreement. They say, oh, well, we filed it online. We don't have any of that yet. So we have to get all of that because for us, when we're drawing up your title documents and for your lender, if you have a lender, when they're drawing up, uh, your loan documents is the signatory authority, the way that we have to put in the signature lines is has to be done in exact certain way based on what the language of your articles, your operating agreement are. And if you don't have any of that specified in there, then we have to know, we can't create the documents, you have no closing. As I said, in addition to that, you probably didn't have a lawful signature on the contract either. So rule number one for everybody in here, please make sure that you have all of your corporate and LLC docs in place before you go do your first deal. If you are running through and you get a deal real fast and you haven't created your LLC, if you're looking to try and save money on that and you want somebody to do it and maybe put it on the HUD at the end, talk to me. We're very open about doing that kind of stuff to save the people the thousand dollars of money that they don't want to spend before they start making money. Uh, and I'm sure it's not just me. I'm sure other good investor attorneys are doing this kind of thing too. So it makes sense for them. We know we're going to get paid on the deal when the deal closes. So it's not a big deal for me to wait to get paid on it. As long as I can get your stuff done to make our life easier also. Um, so that's, that, that's one of the big points when I was going through this. As I said, I can do a whole nother two hours on LLCs and operating agreements and everything that's involved in them. Or y'all can just set a consultation with me if you're interested in that. Because um, I know we've got a bunch of other topics to cover here. Um, strategies. How many people here have ever, well, there's not a beginning investors. Okay, we kind of talked about, okay, so uh, let's talk about wholesaling first. Because it looked like we had a, a vast amount of wholesalers here. Um, for those of y'all who are not too experienced in the wholesaling world, there are two ways to legally transfer properties in Georgia as a wholesaler. Either time, you are going to go sign a purchase and sales agreement with your seller. That's the first thing that you need to do is go get a valid contract signed with your seller. After that, 
there are two options. You can either assign your contract out to a buyer for an assignment fee. Let me be very clear about this. You do not sign another purchase and sales agreement with your buyer. That is not what you do. You sign an assignment agreement. The second that you sign a purchase and sales agreement with your end buyer, you are setting yourself up for a double closing. You have also signed a contract with them saying that you are going to sell this house to them and you are representing a lot of things depending on what your contract looks like, which is a whole other conversation we'll have in a second. Um, if you are planning on assigning the contract, don't sign a contract and then go back and do and say, oh, no, 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 we wanted to do an assignment on this. From a closing attorney perspective, um, we have already worked up a whole nother separate file and are done with all the work. When you come back at closing and say, oh, no, no, we don't have that closing anymore. It's only one closing. Let's just turn it into an assignment. So we're actually ending up doing twice the amount of work and making half the amount of money. So it does not make your closing attorney real happy when y'all do that either. Um, but it's also the way the files are set up in our software, it is a royal pain in the butt and it delays closing, to be honest. It makes things harder on us to get everything done for y'all. An assignment agreement. I can send everybody in this room my assignment agreement that, that I have. It is a very simple form. All it states is that you are assigning out all of your rights in that contract to your end buyer for a certain amount of money. The main things that need to be in that assignment agreement are how much money you're making, your assignment fee, how much money you want them to put down, which basically is them covering your earnest money. And usually I would throw in, I mean, if you have, let's say your, your earnest money was $1,000 that you had to put down, make theirs 1500 and make it non-refundable. And if you want to take it up front, take it up front. If you want to take it all when it closes, then take it all when it closes. I always recommend getting your earnest money replaced out as soon as you get an assignment agreement done. And there's a place in a good assignment agreement to write that out. Make it non-refundable. Okay, so what happens at that point, um, did you just turn that up? Anyway. Uh, I didn't turn it up because I can't hear it from back here. Oh, okay. Um, so what happens at that point is you are out of the equation. If you, have, if, if you have got a purchase and sales agreement with your seller and then you have assigned it out to your end buyer, you are out of it. You don't have to do anything at that point. However, when it gets to closing, your assignment fee, however much money that was, is going onto the settlement statement. Don't ever ask your closing attorney not to put the assignment fee on the settlement statement. It's fraud, you cannot do that. <laughs> this is the difference in an assignment and a double closing. People say, well, why would I double close if I can just assign it out um, and step out, I don't have to go on title, I don't have any of the liability, I don't have to come to closing and sign anything, I just give them my wiring instructions and the attorney sends me my assignment fee. Well, from a rule of thumb, from somebody that's probably closed, I don't know, a few thousand you know, assignments versus double closings in the last 10 years, about $5,000 or so for, well, for the you know, fifty to $150,000 house range, um, if, that's, if that's the price point that most of y'all are working in. I say about $5,000 or so, it's about the tipping point where you really don't necessarily want your buyer knowing how much more they're paying for it. You really don't want these sellers. If y'all are out there guerrilla marketing and these are sellers that, you know, this is their home that they've lived in forever and they're selling it, they don't really like to see that you're making that much money either. A double closing, you are taking title to the property, you are reselling it on to somebody, same day, couple days later, depending on the situation. And the A party seller does not know how much the C party buyer is buying it for. The C party buyer does not know how much the A party seller is selling it to you for. Now, later on down the line, does a lot of that become public record? Yes, but at the time of closing for at least six weeks or so, until everything gets reported, they're not gonna know, and a deal's not gonna blow up at the table because somebody sits down and they see that you're making a 15, twenty thirty thousand dollar assignment fee and they're selling the house for eighty thousand um, dollars so we always recommend a double close when you're making a good amount of money if you're only making a few thousand dollars on the assignment then to be honestly an assignment is just a simpler transaction at that point in time so assignments those are easy you have a contract and then you have an assignment agreement that's it that's your two dots you're out of it double closings we have many different kinds of double closings in regards to how you can fund your double closings. Out of all the wholesalers here that plan on doing double closings, how many of y'all are gonna be doing them with your own cash? Zero in the room. That's, that, that's why we're gonna go through the rest of these. So, there are two different kinds of funding after using your own cash in order to do a wholesale double closing. There's transactional funding and there's pass-through funding. 
up until oof, six, seven years ago or so, pass-through funding wasn't even legal. I got up on a panel, I think in this room, about five years ago, six years ago, and told everybody, you can't be doing pass-through funding. Not the way that people were doing it. And a couple of the attorneys up here had a little bit of an argument about it. Um, pass-through funding is when you are taking the C party's funds and you are purchasing your property as the wholesaler in the middle from the seller with their money. What happened is, is after the crash, a, a lot of things that happened before the crash was blamed on the real estate investment market. Okay, People were artificially inflating the prices of properties. They were selling them back and forth to each other. There was a lot of sketchy things that real estate investors were doing prior to the crash. And so flipping, had a really bad term. It was a horrible term back then. But after the crash, when all the market fell down, and honestly, the people in this room and everybody else that you will meet at all the real estate investor events saved the country. I mean, the real estate investment community came in and literally rebuilt this entire economy. They came in, purchased houses, rehabbed them, made them better, whether they were renting them out to people or reselling them to people. The, the real estate investment community totally took a, took a switch and took a turn and there was a lot more respect and clout given to this community um, as opposed to what was going on 15, 20 years ago. With that, the title insurance underwriters. Um, okay, so you have, I know I'm going to kind of go back and forth on this, but so you have, you have local ordinances, you have state laws, you have federal laws. We have to abide by all of those things compliantly in order to get a deal done. In addition to that, we have, you're getting title insurance when you're purchasing this, these, your properties and your buyers are buying title insurance. You also have title insurance regulations. There are things that the title insurance underwriters require for you to either have in your contracts or for you to sign off on in your closing documents or need to be in your corporate documents. These are all requirements, just like lenders that might be in the room. You have things called lender overlays. So the lenders have requirements and the title insurance and the attorneys have requirements of things that y'all need to have done correctly in order for a transaction to be compliant and be regulatory. It might not affect a, a law, it might not be illegal for you not to do it, but you're still not gonna be able to get a deal done. So one of these big things was the pass-through funding situation. And what happened was, is this was before the forms, I don't know how many of y'all have, that haven't done a deal yet are familiar with the forms that you sign at closing. There's two different closing statements now. There's the old one, which is the HUD-1 settlement statement. You'll see those in cash transactions. Attorneys still use those. Um, and then when you're dealing with a retail lender, uh, you have to use what's called a CD now. It's a closing disclosure. Um, and this, the documents changed when the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau went into effect a few years ago. Um, once again, closing docs will be a whole other class right now. I don't want to get into too much on it, but those are federal forms by the federal government. In the top left-hand corner of the HUD-1 settlement statement, you have to check a box, and the box either says cash deal, it says conventional insured, conventional uninsured, FHA, VA, or USDA. It's asking what kind of loan it is. When you're doing transactional or pass-through funding, you're checking off cash. You know why? Because there's no loan, there's no security need being reported, there's no mortgage, depending on if you're in another state, and therefore it's considered a cash transaction. Well, the problem is we were checking off cash and the federal government was saying that that was fraud. They were saying, you are telling, you're signing, because I'm pretty sure most of y'all's contracts, you're going in and telling them that you're cash buyers. And that's probably how you're going out and getting these, these, these contracts. If you tell them that you're coming in with lending, you're probably not gonna get those contracts over the other investors, because there's hundreds and thousands of y'all across the city competing for these properties. So, here's the rule on fraud. So me and my business partner looked at each other and we went to our title insurance underwriters and we said, well, an element of fraud is non-disclosure. We said, if we're disclosing to an extent, how can they ever say that we're, that, 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 not us, but that the, that, that the buyers are committing fraud by saying that they're doing this through, through using cash? And so what the title insurance underwriters came up with and agreed with, with the bar, with the state bar, um, was that there was particular language mm -hmm. that either needs to be put into the contracts or can be signed off on at the closing table. Uh, for us, at my firm, we, we say it needs to be in the contracts. I don't even like to be doing it at the closing table because a deal can blow up at the closing table if they find out about it. This language does not tell the buyer or the seller how much money you are making. 
it does tell them from, so the language in, the language for the one for the seller says, uh, essentially, I recognize that the person that is purchasing this house is reselling it onto somebody else. <laughs> Never use that language. <laughs> this sounds like that's better. Sounds like more positive, more positive music. I can yell for a little bit. Mom. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, that's all good. So. So the language, the language that needs to be in it for the seller um, is basically just establishing that you as the B party buyer is purchasing the house and you are reselling it onto somebody else for a profit and are using their money to purchase it. Not once have I seen anybody argue with it. As long as, they are, as, long as these sellers are making their money uh, that they agree to, they're fine with it. And for the end buyer, it says, uh, I recognize that the person that is selling me this property is acquiring it from somebody else and that they are using my funds to purchase it and resell it onto me for a profit. And it's a little bit more extensive language than that word for word, but that is the effective wording that needs to go into it. So that is the big thing that you need to have. And the other big thing that you need to make sure is that it's got to, 99% it, of the time, it's got to be cash on cash, meaning your end buyer has got to be using cash for you to be able to do it. Lenders do not like for you to borrow their money uh, for the lease payment on select models during the summer value sales event. We good? Um, so the lenders don't generally like for you to be using their money to go then take it to buy it and resell it to somebody else for a profit. Okay, the Taco Bell new introductions. <laughs> Sure. It's not? Okay. Um, there are some private card money lenders around town who are doing loans who don't necessarily mind, uh, who don't necessarily mind that you're doing it. So there are some people that will allow it, but the big guys, they're not going to allow you to use their money through pass-through funding. So what do you do in the case that you're doing a double closing? There's lending on the back end or you couldn't get one of the parties to sign off on it and you don't have any cash to do it, that's where transactional funding comes in hand. So transactional funders are people that come in and fund your deal for one day, maybe they need gap funding, and they fund it for maybe a week or so because you've got to close with the seller, the end buyer's lender isn't ready yet. Those are very, very key lenders. Um, you good? Okay. Uh, those are very, very key people to be introduced projects, okay? There are a lot of good Atlanta Rhea people who are, uh, I call, I'll call them mentors. Uh, they're, they're, they're big, they've been doing this for a long time. They take you under their wing and they also do the transactional funding for it. I also have lenders that do transactional funding and then I've got a couple of people that I can refer you all to that are just straight funders that do transactional funding too. They really don't need a lot from you, but when they ask you for your, your stuff up front, we're gonna go through it right now, you want to make sure that you have all of this prepared. I started with corporate docs. Make sure that you have all of your corporate docs in hand. Make sure that you have proper identification uh, when for the closing attorney and for the lender, um, uh, for the funder. You're going to need. We have to do a Patriot Act search, so you, you've got to have a valid ID. I can't tell you how many times recently I've been asked from people they get to closing and they didn't bring their ID with them, and I said, "Well, sorry, you've got to go back and get your ID. We cannot close without it legally." Um, have your contracts in place. Remember, double closing: A to B contract with the seller, B to C contract with the buyer. Assignment: Don't need it. It's just an A to B contract and an assignment agreement. <laughs> Uh, yes. No, I you said. Um, some sort of valuation, and, and this is a big, big topic that we can talk about for a little bit. Generally speaking, an appraisal is what everybody would prefer. You can go get a CMA, a BPO, you know, go get an agent to go do a, a valuation. But the problem is that 
a funder might look at that and say, <clears throat> but say, oh, you know, they just ran out and had one of their friends that was an agent go do this. I don't know that I can rely on this valuation. They're going to want to see a certain, just ju just like the end buyer's lender, they're going to want to see a certain amount of equity in the deal. Um, it doesn't happen very often because nine times out of ten when you're doing transactional funding, it's the same day. And the transactional funders have to work in very, very, uh, in, a, in a good way with the attorneys because they're relying on us. Because essentially the way it works is you go in and you get all of the documents signed. A party, B party on both sides, and the C party. And you have to wait until the end buyer's funds are in the attorney's trust account as well as the lender's funds are in the trust account when there's a lender before we even tell the transactional funder, send us your money. So basically the B to C closing needs to be done before the transactional funder is gonna send their money in. So at that point, the transactional funder has very, very little risk. Uh, in gap funding situations where, as I said, where you've gotta close, you're gonna lose your contract with your seller, so you've gotta close and they're funding you for like a few days or a week or you're waiting for your buyer's lender to get done. Those situations, you're, they're, they're almost always gonna want an appraisal. Um, they might take a BPO, it's funder by funder. Most of them are gonna actually want you to go out and spend a couple hundred bucks for the appraisal. Yes? Yeah. Uh, the transactional funding, that institution or individual? Um, any, any, any of the above. Um, so transactional funding to me is actually looked at, it's not considered lending. It's looked at, uh, it's looked at as kind of like a joint venture. They are your funding partner. Um, the documents that are signed are, are gonna look more like lending. Most transactional funders, some don't make you sign anything on a same day transaction deal. Some make you sign a note and security deed um, in case the deal goes awry and then they'll and then they have the attorney shred it you know, as soon as the deal is done. But they want to have it there in case they're having to hold. If, they, if they're giving you $200,000, they want to make you sign something on that property in case your B2C closing doesn't go through and you're stuck with the property for a couple months. Yes? Should the original contract be notarized? No, a purchase and sales agreement has absolutely no notarization requirements on it. So purchase and sales agreements are, are much easier than your closing documents. Your purchase and sales agreements, you can, digi you can digitally sign, the agents can digitally sign, there's no notarization requirements. Um, and some of the agents in the room can kind of talk about that as well, but purchase and sales agreements are real easy these days. Um, because you can just PDF them, it can all be done online, we can accept them, we don't need originals at any point in time. Um, George has made it pretty easy on eSign for that portion of it. Um, unfortunately, the closing situation has not worked like that yet, like some of the other states. Uh, we still have to have originals on everything. Georgia is advancing right now in e-reporting, which, once again, is a whole nother topic, but basically what that means is Hopefully in about two or three years, it'll be across Metro Atlanta. Uh, about a hundred of the rural counties already have this. But basically, as soon as you close and you sign your deeds, we walk into our other room and we scan it to the courthouse and it's reported immediately, which will be absolutely amazing for y'all. It's gonna be even better for us because all of our liability lies in between the time y'all sign those documents, not all of it, but a lot of it, in between when y'all sign those documents and when we can get those documents to report it. Georgia is what's known as a race state meaning a race to the courthouse. It does not matter what date the documents are signed, your warranty deed is signed, it matters what date it actually gets reported at the courthouse. That is the order of, um, you know, the, the order of people that have title or have liens on the property. Um, so it's very important to get it reported fast. Um, trying to go backwards on this. I'm trying to remember where I was. Um, we were talking about... You're telling us everything that we need. Oh, for the, that's right, okay, okay. So valuations, as I was saying, on gap funding deals, if you have a deal that you're probably gonna have to get funding for like, as I said, two days, three days, seven days, 10 days, maybe even a month. There are lenders that do gap and bridge deals also, but there, that's gonna be looked at as almost um, almost like normal lending like you would go to a hard money lender. The, your underwriting requirements on that are gonna be much more staunch. They're gonna be looking at Probably that's an income, they're going to be looking at loan to value ratio, all the things that a lender would tell you that they're going to be looking for. I'm going to have to speak up, huh? Um, so once again, these are things that you guys all need to be aware of. Um, it's things that you want to get ahead of 
you want to have all this prepared. Let me, let me tell you, my favorite clients, I've got a couple of wholesale investor clients that probably do, I don't know, we'll call it like 10 to 15 deals a month, which is just, you know, 20 to 30 closings a month for this. Their, their processor, and I get that most of y'all probably don't have staff, like this is a big office, but, um, but their, their processor, when they send their contracts over, they have this big form email that they send that has a contract attached to it, and it gives us every little detail of the transaction. Everybody's contact information, if there are agents involved, all of their contact information. When we get, when we get a contract over it, the very first two things that we do is we have to order title, and we send out buyer and seller information sheets. Y'all take a look, because I'm sure you're gonna end up with 20 different closing attorneys. I'd love if all y'all close with me, but that's not gonna happen. Y'all will end up with a bunch of different closing attorneys across the state. Take a look at the buyer and seller information sheets that all of us closing attorneys send out. They're not all the same, but they're gonna have 99% of the same information requested in it. Get ahead of that. Start realizing that if you're collecting that information ahead of time and distributing it to the closing attorney, you're helping us get your deal done faster. I can't tell y'all how many times we are chasing around simple information that we need before we can even start doing stuff. If it's in an HOA and you don't give us the HOA information, we can't order the HOA closing letter. The HOA might take three to five days to get this back to us to begin with. I can tell y'all how many people in this room want to send a contract to me on Monday and close on Friday, if they could. Yeah, everybody. So, we've done it before. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that it, it, it's, it's a very realistic time frame, but we pulled it off a few times. But if you want these, we, we do a, a very, very typically do seven to ten day closes. So we'll get a contract on Monday or Tuesday and we're closing mid next week. If you want things like that to happen, getting out ahead of the things that you know somebody's going to request from you every single time is helpful. So I don't want to go through everything that's in a buyer or seller's information sheet, but it's basically just contact information and it's asking questions particularly the seller information sheet. Um, is the person that's on title alive or dead? That is, that, is, that is a very important one that I'm sure when we get to the Q&A we can talk all about dead people on title. Um, is there a divorce going on? Um, is there, are there any outstanding liens? Or, did you ever file for a bankruptcy? There, there's a million little questions like that. Simple yes or no questions that your answer if it is yes might mean that we have an extra two weeks of work ahead of us and if we can start getting at that from the second that you order title and you send the contract in, as opposed to after we get title back and we look at everything that's going on on title, that's gonna be two, three, four, or five days later, depending on what county it's in and how long it takes the abstractors to get the title work back to us and for us to do a title examination. Those three, four, or five days, that, that first week that we have your contract is the extra week that all of y'all will come back and complain to us when you wanted to be closing in 10 days, that it takes 15 because we couldn't even start working on the pre-closing work to order payoffs, to order HOAs, to try and get probate documents from the courthouse because there's a dead person on title. All of these kind of things are very, very important to get out ahead of. Help your closing attorney help you. You want deals done fast? Trust me, we like to make money also. So we want the deals to close just as fast as you guys do. We want them to be just as painless for you as they are for us, but it's, it's, it's a situation where everybody needs to work together. That went back to the whole synergistic approach that I had at the beginning of this, and that is, that is you, your closing attorney, and your lenders, most likely, and your real estate agents, all kind of working together to create a synergistic environment to make these deals happen. Um, where am I on time? You're good. Um, I'm trying to think of other big topics I kind of wanted to cover. We can get into title issues. I mean, I just kind of started talking about some of the things that can come up. You guys are probably, most likely, um, finding properties that don't necessarily have clean titles. Um, unfortunately, in the real estate investor world, the properties that, <laughs> I've probably seen 90, 95% of the properties that y'all are finding are not gonna come back to us just with a clean title where we can just go ahead and close. There's going to have been a transfer, another transfer, maybe a foreclosure, maybe somebody filed a lien on it, maybe somebody hasn't paid their taxes on it in eight years, maybe somebody hasn't paid their water on it for 10 years. We had a fun one that we actually closed today. The seller had a $23,400 water bill. Guess what? The Cab County filed a lien. They just started filing liens. So it used to happen. Water bills are a very, very confusing thing for people because 
it's it, up until recently, the, the water department had the right to lean. And because they had the right to lean for water bills, that meant that we have to order water bills and get payoffs and do it just like we would a mortgage payoff or a tax lien payoff. Even though there wasn't an actual lien reported at the county courthouse, they had the right to do it. Therefore, we are required to get it and pay it off. Now, you can negotiate them down sometimes, um, but uh, I'm telling you, this is literally in the last six weeks. I've seen it for the first time. It actually started leaning. So there's only certain counties that have the right to do it, but if you're doing it around Metro Atlanta, the county Fulton, you're gonna start seeing it all the time. It could be for a $50 water bill, or it could be, as I said, for a $23,400 water bill. And let me tell you, a lot of the times these sellers didn't even know that they had it. Um, depending on whether you're getting the property from a different investor, or whether this is somebody that's lived in the property for a while, sometimes they had a crack in a pipe. Some, hmm? Did I shut it off? <laughs> you know, from our perspective, because the, the, let me tell you, the city of Atlanta Water Department is our nemesis. Um, but yeah, you would think maybe they would just shut it off. <laughs> because because what happens is, when, I mean, let me tell you the let me, let me tell you the fun stuff. Because because the closing attorneys, when when we miss the water bill, because it happens, you know, when you do two thousand closings a year, you're gonna miss one or two of them. Um, what happens is we're the ones that get to pay for somebody's water. Um, because our type is, and, the, and let me tell you all this, title insurance does not cover water. Title insurance, well, I'll tell you what, if it was leaned, it will. So title insurance will cover it if the county actually, or the city of Atlanta, whoever it is, actually went in and filed the lien. But, you know, I, that just started. Like, I, this is a, these are the first ones we've ever seen actually lean. So for title insurance, there's an exception on the title insurance policies that say title insurance doesn't cover it. So guess who covers it when it's mails? Us. Now, I paid an $11,000 water bill for somebody last year. I was not real happy about it. I was not real happy with my staff member about it either. But um, water bills can be very, very ugly. Y'all would be shocked. I feel like the city, uh, why, would, why would they turn it off? This is, the, this is the whole thing. They're still billing for it. Somebody pays for it at some point in time. It'll be at the attorney a buyer, a seller, whoever they can get to negotiate to do it, eventually those water bills get paid and the city get the money. So, so they'll just, say, yeah, you can't, and you can't turn off sewer, but sewer, sewer is generally about like one tenth of, of it, if not less than that. Um, but yeah, so once again, getting out ahead of these title issues, water bills, um, go meet your sellers. <laughs> one of the most important things is getting to know your seller, help the closing attorney coordinate with these sellers. Make sure that you're getting, if you're, if you're working with a real estate agent, a lot of this is gonna be more on your real estate agent than it is on you. If you're working without real estate agents and you're trying to do most of this stuff on your own, we need our investors to actively be involved in helping us get the seller information sheets to them and get it filled out and get it back to us and helping coordinate signings and closings it's a lot of these sellers are very difficult to reach and y'all are the ones that are building these relationships with them and i'm going to be honest a lot of them don't have email um, there's so many different situations that come up where it's very hard for us to get in contact with the seller that y'all obviously met at some point in time because you got a contract signed with them and negotiated with them so yes sir how do you close with out of state sellers okay um, Okay, let's talk about out-of-state sellers and buyers. Uh, Georgia is an attorney state, meaning that when you do a real estate closing in Georgia, you have to have an attorney go through the documents and sign them. You also have to have the money running through an attorney's escrow account. Uh, there's only about five states left in the country that are required attorney states. Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, New York, I think Rhode Island. Um, there are a couple of other quasi-attorney states, but in most of the rest of the country, uh, how, how many people here are from out-of-state Right, so a lot of y'all are probably used to title companies. It's not, there's, there's no closing attorneys. Most of those title companies have attorneys that work for them that's doing some of the legal work and the title work and maybe are sitting down and going through the closing documents. But in most of those states, it's just a notary. And the notary's job is to go in, their, their job is not to go in and try to explain the documents to people. Their job is to go sit at a table with them and make sure they're signing the documents and that they're witnessing that they signed the documents. Georgia is an attorney state because we uh, we use security deeds, not mortgages, and we are uh, non-judicial foreclosure, meaning that if, if you don't pay your note and a lender wants to foreclose on you, 
Uh, they don't sue you and go through the court system. It doesn't take three years like it does in Florida for a lender to come take your property back. Every single time you purchase a house and you get a loan on it, there is a rider attached to the security deed that's called the waiver of borrower's rights. And what that states is that you are waiving your uh, constitutional rights to notice and hearing at foreclosure stage. 30 days of default, 90 days for voter, and then they can take it back. You've signed away your, your constitutional rights, and there's a closing attorney's affidavit is in the middle section of that document that says, and this is where I'm getting to this point, that says, I personally appeared and explained to this borrower that Georgia is a non-judicial foreclosure state and that they are waiving their constitutional rights. Because of that, it has been dictated, that's called the closing attorney's affidavit, because of that, it has been dictated that it is still supposed to be attorneys that do all the closings here. So, mail outs, it's half my closings. 10 years ago, pre-crash, you had to get an attorney to sign those. I don't care if somebody was in Hong Kong, if they were in California, or if they were across the border in Alabama, you had to either get a, an attorney to sign it, a Georgia attorney, or the title insurance companies. Uh, let's, uh, we work with, let's say First American is one of our title insurance providers. They're nationwide, they're a massive company. So what we have to do is go through, they have an approved list of their settlement agents, meaning their title companies in all those states, wherever these people are. And the people used to have to drive to one of them and get it signed under them, because at least at that point, it was under the supervision of another title agent of that title insurance underwriter. Then the crash happened. And what happened? These big hedge funds came in and started buying everything. And all of a sudden, there wasn't a buyer at a closing that was in the state of Georgia. And so they, and so they had to adjust uh, their thought processes on what was legal and what is compliant to get documents signed. So here's the rule of thumb now. Uh, we are allowed to use notaries out of state, um, but the notaries have to be approved by our title insurance underwriters. And when I say they have to be approved, it doesn't mean each individual notary. It means that there are big notary signing companies that have been approved that we use and then they, so we pay them and then they, they have to get their notaries approved underneath themselves. Um, and so can we email documents to somebody in California and then say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take them to my bank and get them to notarize? No, they don't trust that. They're signing a security deed, transferring title of property in Georgia has to, we have to be the custodian of the documents. We have to have control over the documents, meaning that we send them to somebody else who's approved, they send them to one of their employees who drives out to the person to get it signed, and they bring it back, scan it, and FedEx it back to us. There's a, there's a custodial rule on the documents. Um, but mail outs are very common and they have gotten, thank God, a lot easier than they used to be. In regards to international mail-outs, if you guys end up with any buyers, we used to have a ton of international buyers on investment properties here. In regards to international buyers, it depends on what country they're in. It's based on a international law that was done. It's called the Hague Convention. Y'all really don't care too much about it, but effectively, you have to find a consulate or an embassy, a U.S. consulate or embassy, for the people to go to, and they can get it notarized there. There are, but there are different rules in different countries. Israel has has it pretty easy there. We can use their notaries. Australia, so some countries like that, it, it's a little bit easier. People are sometimes it's just your buyers are traveling or something like that. But uh, we can talk a little bit more about mail outs if you want. But they're 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 made a lot easier right now. Um, it was much more difficult to do mail outs five ten years ago than it is now. Um, I think I am probably open for questions. I think that I've talked a lot, probably about some stuff y'all didn't care about. And no, I figured, it's all good. It's really good. <laughs> I figured it'd be better to just let y'all ask some questions. All right. Now, I know you had a question over here a few minutes ago. I, you know what I did? I actually wrote it down. I'll, I'll check it out a little bit later. But thank you. <laughs> sure. All right. Sorry about that. Hello. Questions, questions. Yes, sir. <laughs> There's several different types of deeds. Yeah. There, there is the quick claim deed. Yeah. There's the administrative deed. There's the warranty deed. There's a judgment deed. Could okay. you differentiate? Let's, uh, let's talk about these. Yeah. All right, so there are two main kinds of deeds in regards to one transfers title. One puts a lien on title. So if you are doing a quick claim deed, a limited warranty deed, a warranty deed, an administrator or executor's deed, 
All of those are deeds that are going to transfer title from one party to another. A security deed is a deed that a lender uses to put a lien on title. Um, when you record it, you record your transfer deed and then you record your lien deed behind it. Now we just do both of those at the same time. So let's talk about the transfer deeds because that's what you're concerned with. Uh, the most, the, the simplest deed is a quick claim deed. Quick claim deeds are not used very often anymore. Quick claim deeds have zero warranty on title. So when you use a quick claim deed, you're the, you're the buyer. When a seller quick claims you the property, they are warranting absolutely nothing about their ownership of title. You are just hoping that their ownership of title is correct and that there's no liens on you are taking it subject to everything else that is on that property. You might be buying a house for $100,000 and it might have $200,000 of liens on it. You get a quick claim over to you and you just inherited $100,000 of debt. So at that point in time, you're either going to try and quick claim it off to somebody else or you're probably going to just let that debt go into foreclosure at some point in time. Quick claim deeds can be very dangerous. Um, I know this. I bought a package of 41 homes. Ooh, 2011. If y'all like this one, I bought 41 homes for $115,000. Wow. Um, they were they were toxic assets from Citibank that went through. They sold them out through a shell company, and then that shell company was getting rid of them. This 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 stuff happened so fast that I the 41 properties that were on my sheet that I got. I think I ended up with like 32 of them and nine different properties, and about 15 or 20 of them got to foreclosure and went through foreclosure before I even got my deeds like back to my office. So, no, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, well, it's not good, but, it, but it's, it, it, this, was, this was a different, it was crazy back then, but there was a different mindset with it. You Basically, when you bought a package like that, you knew there was going to be about three or four cherries in them that you were going to make a bunch of money off of, and you knew that there would be, you know, a certain portion of them that I bought for $2,000 and I sold it for eight, but that adds up very well. 400% profit on $2,000 is great. Um, over the course of the portfolio, I've made about two and a half times on my money in like two or three years. So, but those ones that they were all quick claim deeds, and let me tell you, I was very upset that a couple of them were gone before. There, there was one that bought it for five thousand dollars. It was worth about one hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars, but it had about seventy, eighty thousand dollars of tax liens on it, and the tax foreclosure happened within like the first six weeks before I got it and it was gone. There was nothing I could do about it. Um, so quick claim deeds, going back to them, are the simplest form of, of, to, to transfer title. But once again, when you get a quick claim, you're taking it subject to everything that's on the property. Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry. Would the exception be purchasing a deed on the courthouse steps? Would the exception be purchasing a deed on the courthouse steps? The exception for what? taken care of once you purchase it. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, the question is, if you purchase a property on the courthouse steps, are all the other liens wiped out? The for, okay, so the first of all, foreclosure law is state by state. In Georgia, when if the, if the primary lien was the one that was being foreclosed on, if it was a first mortgage, it will wipe out most of every, it'll wipe out any sort of uh, other security needs. So second mortgage, home equity line, any of that. It's gonna wipe out HOA liens and a lot of other um, material mints liens. So if a builder has some, so all of that gets wiped, it doesn't wipe out federal liens. So if there's a federal, like a FIFA, and a federal income tax lien, federal liens don't get wiped. Um, so most of your stuff gets wiped at foreclosure, um, but not all of it. And that's also making sure that if you're buying into the courthouse, that that was the primary mortgage that got foreclosed on. Sometimes it's a second, and that and the second was just going through foreclosure, and there's there's still a first mortgage on it, um, you know, which was probably eighty percent of the mortgage value. So what type of I guess but like the deed, see it's kind of awesome. it's kind of two different questions when you're asking. The the quick claim deed is the same quick claim deed if that's what they're using. Okay, so what you're what you were really asking is at foreclosure. Doesn't all the other stuff go away anyway if you're buying it at foreclosure? Uh, yes, it should. Um, and there are also title companies and closing attorneys that you can order foreclosure searches and they'll do those for you. It's much cheaper. Um, foreclosure searches, um, you know, because people order 30, 40, 50 of them at a time when they're researching foreclosure properties. Those searches are usually like 30 to $50. Not, they're not 200 bucks like a normal title exam is. Uh, yeah. But isn't it true that uh, people could fraudul fraudulently 
and quick claim deed a house to you that they don't actually own? Okay, so let's talk about fraudulent quick claim deeds. We call them kitchen counter deeds. Um, once again, our liability and one of the it's good when you talk about title insurance too. One of the great reasons why you guys should buy title insurance. Um, fraudulent quick claim deeds. People can pull a quick claim deed off of the internet and go sign it and have their brother who is a notary notarize it with a witness and go down to the courthouse and record it. And all of a sudden on title, that person now owns the property. Um, we had a fun one two years ago where the grandmother passed away, the grandmother passed away and it was left to the three grandkids. One of them lived out of state and the other two lived here. And one of the two other grandkids had somebody forged the other grandkid's signature on a quick claim deed. And all three got reported into the seller and then the seller was selling the property to our buyer. Well, this was like five years before we got the closing. There's absolutely no way when my title abstractor goes to the courthouse, runs title, gives it to us, my attorneys and my title people look it over, we see a clean chain of title, we're good, we do a closing. My grandson came back to Georgia about a year later. And, and this was an investor that bought the property and they were doing a massive rehab. This was not a cheap property. I think it was it bought it at about 170 and we're doing like a hundred thousand dollar rehab on it. So, you know, ARV on it was 350, 400. They were just finishing up all the construction when the other grandson came back and came back and was like, oh, doesn't look like grandma's house. Who <laughs> <laughs> walks up, who's doing all this work on this house. And very quickly we discovered that, you know, somebody had forged it. So our investor, thank God they had title insurance, not so good for our insurance company, but um, had to file a title insurance claim for the value of the property at that to $400,000. Because guess what? They didn't own the property at all. So, so I know that that was that was more of a title insurance story, but it, it, it's it's also yeah. Um, so, uh, Which, two parts. Um, yeah. Does a tax lien uh, foreclosure wipe out the federal lien? And uh, you know, in Georgia, for state taxes. And could you return to talking about the different kinds of transfer deeds? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I don't think, and I'm going to be honest, I don't, I don't know the answer to this. Hey, Greg, can you repeat the question for the people who couldn't hear you? He, he asked two questions. He said, does a tax lien foreclosure wipe a federal tax lien? I don't think, I, I don't know, I don't think anything wipes a federal tax lien. I am not aware, I think a, a, you can do it through a, through a court case or a bankruptcy, but I don't think that any other kind of foreclosure, and I, I, I will have to find the answer out to that. Um, I don't know that anything wipes a federal tax lien. Um, I will find out the answer to that. How about state? Huh? How about state tax lien? An estate tax lien? State. State. Does a state tax foreclosure wipe a federal? No, the state foreclosure wipe out the state lien. What kind of foreclosure? The Georgia tax lien. Does the foreclosure wipe out the Georgia tax lien? It depends on what's being foreclosed on. No, 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 I'm saying it depends on what kind of, we were talking about different kinds of, federals will always stay on, states can be wiped. Not always though, and that's what I'm saying it depends, so it's it's different, this is like a whole, once again, a whole nother conversation, but an HOA could foreclose on HOA dues not being paid and foreclose on a property. So it's there's there's different kinds of liens that, and different kinds of foreclosures. And the rules on the hierarchy of those liens and what gets wiped and what doesn't get wiped depends on what lien is being foreclosed on and what kind of lien was on it and what the order of reporting on it was. So sometimes it depends on w which priority that lien had and sometimes it depends on what the actual kind of lien that was being foreclosed or is trying to be wiped does. But I know he wanted to get back back to the different kinds of deeds. So, because there's a big thing we need to talk about, uh, warranty deeds versus limited warranty deeds. Yeah. So, a warranty deed is the typical kind of deed that you transfer title with. A warranty deed is warranting the condition of the title to the property all the way back. And they're saying, I am transferring this property to you in fee simple, you are getting all of the rights to this property, it is yours and I am warranting the title to this property. A limited warranty deed, and we're going to talk about the difference because it's a big 
big thing right now. A limited warranty deed is a deed from the seller warranting the title of the property from the point that they bought the property to the point that they're selling you the property. So if there was, let's say, an HOA lien from the person before your seller that had like a $5,000 HOA lien on the property, maybe that closing attorney missed it, um, or maybe the HOA missed it at that point in time, but it's still sitting on there and it's grown with penalties and fines for the last five years, and now it's $10,000, and that seller gets the closing, and the, uh, the lien was from two sellers ago, if it was a limited warranty deed that transferred the property to you, then they were only warranting their part of the title. They're, they're warranting saying, I didn't have any other liens or anything on it. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect the one that was on there. So you would still be responsible for paying that or filing a title insurance claim because your, your title company should have seen that. And you would have to file a title insurance claim to cover it. Whereas a warranty deed would cover it all the way back. So from the time that that land, however far back the that they're searching from the time of development, a, war a full warranty deed is warranting the, the condition of the property from the very beginning. Limited is just from the time that the seller owned it forward and the quick claim doesn't do any. Executor and administrator's deeds, those are very simple. It is, it is a transfer of title being done by the executor or administrator of an estate after somebody has passed away. It's just a different name. The effect of it is the same thing. It is just being, it's not being done by that person because that person um, is no longer with us. So the person that is responsible for their estate is signing off on it as the executor or administrator is signing the property over. Yes, ma'am. A good amount in the wholesale price to do a double closing. Yes. But you also mentioned that um, when we, when in the future, you, the courts can do this scanning for the recording. That means it's done the next day. Yeah. So does it mean that even with a double closing, it's not going to take much time for the new person to know what the uh, profit margin is in the previous transaction? Uh, there's no purchase price on a warranty, limited warranty deed or quick claim deed. So the, 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 the title transferring deed doesn't tell you how much money it is. It's typically when somebody's getting lending, uh, the, the price of the security deed goes up there. And so you can kind of figure out if somebody's getting a loan for $300,000 that they're probably buying the house for about three hundred fifty thousand. You know, whatever the ratio is on the, on, on the loan to value. Um, there are also, there are directories, there's one called the Hughes directory. There, there's all sorts of places where you can look up public record on a lot of this stuff. I mean, look at Zillow. I mean, you, you can pop on Zillow these days and figure out um, what a purchase price is not very long after. So the fact that e-recording is gonna happen, I don't think is really going to affect the difference in assignments and double closings and how fast somebody's gonna figure out. If, they, if, if, if somebody is actively trying to figure out how much money you're making on a deal, and, and they are, they have some resources to be able to do so, they're gonna be able to do it relatively fast one way or the other. Um, I, I don't think that you were, I have not heard, there are a lot of other states that have been in e-recording uh, for years now, and I have not heard anything about any of those markets being affected uh, in regards to wholesale transactions because things are being e-recorded. All it's done is made things be able to go way faster and for people to do more transactions. Yeah. So, Different topic um, to asset protection, LLC maybe as, as one way to, to protect uh, your assets. I'm also reading a lot about land trusts um, and land some people trusts. want to use it in combination with LLCs. So that's a topic I'm, I'm not so clear on. Could you elaborate a little bit? Different closing attorneys around town have differing opinions on land trusts. We don't, we don't know. Um, I, don't, I, I just don't even touch them anymore. The point of trust, the, 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 legal, the legal idea of a trust originally not a land trust, but a trust in general, is a way to protect your assets you know, for a family member, um, for a business partner. There, there's a lot of different ways that you can use trust. The, the land trust, I'm not gonna say too much on camera about this, because we don't, we, don't, we don't really like them. And I'm not gonna say that other attorneys won't do them, but land trusts are misused a lot. Um, they certainly can be. Yeah, and there's no, there's no need for a land trust. So generally speaking, the reason why somebody wants to do a land trust is for confidentiality reasons. They're, 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 they're trying, because they don't want, you can, you can have the same effect by using other kinds of, of, of business entities without having to do a land trust. Uh, they're misused so often that personally we don't, we don't touch them. And how so. are they misused? <laughs> 
Um, they were used to create a lot of fraudulent transactions. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to go, I, I really don't want to go on land trust right now if, if I have my brother's about it. Um, there are closing attorneys around town who know how to use them properly and want to take the time um, to go through them and have, have their clients do them, and they do do them properly. Um, and I can give you referrals for that if it's somebody that you want like that. We personally just don't go. Did you have a follow-up question? Is that it? No. Very good. Well, you have a question over here? What happens if you have a condemned property that you are working at? Buy, it's been condemned. Buy, buy condemned property. I mean, you've got to wait for them to demo it, right? I mean, that's more of a permitting thing. You guys, are any of the net worth or Western guys still here? I mean, y'all probably know the answer to that better than me. You get at least two here still. I mean, if it's condemned, you can't do a transfer if it's under condemnation until it's demoed, I believe. I honestly, I don't even know the answer. I figured an agent would know the answer to that better than me. I don't know about condemned, but I talked to a code enforcement officer the other day in Gwinnett County. He said technically, if there's code violations on the house, you're not supposed to transfer. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, a, a condemnation is just an element of, it's just one kind of code violation. It's just the worst kind. Yeah. If you're going to buy a code house... We're not supposed to transfer if there's anything, if any of that shows up on title, we're not, we, we can't transfer. That is a cloud on title that we have to wait to clear. You can't, you can't buy a condemned property and, and rehab that property. You can, you just better be real careful. Is, that, is there another question on that? I, I mean, well, hey, his question was, can I buy a condemned property instead of condemning it, rebuild it, instead of having it torn down? I be, I, I'm pretty sure if it's condemned, if it's marked condemned, you have to tear it down. Right. If, it's it's condemned, then, if it's condemned, they want to use it for public use. So yeah, well, you let, wouldn't be able to buy it. Yeah. Let me, let me so say they would want to build like a school or a church, something that everyone can use. So. If it was condemned, I don't think they yeah, had the option for it. Because yeah, I don't know, I, I, I assume, I don't know if you want to rehab this condemned house and make it livable, there, or if you want to tear it down and rebuild new. There was an article, and there was an article on the news the other night about this house that was condemned that had 25 dogs in it, and an elderly lady and a 28-year-old kid that was taking care of his grandmother. And the house, they condemned the house because of the, the, the condition of the floors and the living conditions in the house. <laughs> So I was saying that is that an avenue that you could look at that kind of a property to take those properties and yeah because I almost bought a condemned property but it already had demo orders mm -hmm. we were going to demo it and just we'll buy it to buying a lot you're going to do new construction we've been open 12 years I've never closed on a condemned house <laughs> that's that's my simplest answer and I can't say that I have either I came close but I didn't do it. All right, yeah. other questions? Talk real loud, please. Yes, that threshold when you do a, a double closing compared to an assignment in Atlanta, what amount? Yeah, I, I said, and look, th there are a lot of other investors in this room that can, that can answer the question too. From, as I said, thousands of transactions that I've seen, from the ones that I've seen that have kind of blown up, the 50 to 100, $150,000 homes, I'd say around $5,000 or so, anything above that can get a little sketchy. Unless you are, this is a small world of power relationship, you have a good relationship with your buyers and sellers, it doesn't matter. I've seen people put $30,000 assignment fees on a $40,000 house. Um, well, this is why you're all in this business, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've seen larger ones for, I, I have some wholesalers that do $200,000, $300,000 houses and they're, they're, they're doing $15,000, $20,000 assignments on those. Um, typically speaking, the sellers are looking at is if, if, if 6%, they don't care at all about if you're not using an agent because they know that if there were agents involved, that they're going to come out of pocket 6% anyway. So that's just a given for them that they're not going to argue with that. Generally speaking, if they're getting their price, they're going to be okay with it. The buyers are the ones that particularly if you're selling to experienced buyers. So that's really also the thing is who are your, who are your buyers? Who's on your buyers list? Are your buyers other investors that are buying up hundreds of homes too, that have a staff of people negotiating their contracts and their prices? Do they have 10 other houses that they could go buy? You know, if they see a $15,000 assignment fee, they're gonna beat you down over it most likely. 
once again, the New Western Network guys in here, y'all can talk about that too. They, they're the ones that are doing those negotiations yeah. a lot. I mean, what, what's, your, what's your threshold on it? I mean, we, we like to do volume, so we're not trying to make a big buck yeah. on a house. We do 40, 50 properties per month. So to do that kind of volume, we're not making the biggest, biggest buck. We like to leave being on the boat with the investor. So when you guys come across the property, you guys do make money, and then you come back to us. So I mean, that's how we personally operate. A, a good rule of thumb for new people is if you're making over 10%, you might want to double close. Yeah. 10,000 or 10%, you might want to double close. What's the difference in closing costs between double close? Oh, yeah, let's talk about closing costs. So, from at my office, the only difference in the A to B and the B to C closing costs is that we don't charge for the title exam twice because we only have to do that once. Everything else, we have to do all of the exact same amount of work. And people say, oh, you know, but you're doing it on the same property, da 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 da. The title work is the only thing that we're doing once. Everything else that we have to do, we have to do twice. Um, but what we also do, and we haven't gotten into contracts, which is something else I kind of wanted to talk about a little earlier, but. One of the other things that we do, almost all of our big wholesale clients do it, is they actually pass on their closing costs to the buyer. Uh, their contract has a special step in it that says, uh, you're also gonna pay us for our acquisition costs. So it's something that you should look at varying in your contracts. Wait, how many questions we got left so we don't want to gauge the time here? You, but uh, you can use that as a right here? bargaining chip, correct? Uh, the fact that you can close. Hold on a second. I want you to say it real loud. Okay. So if I can hear you. So uh, my question is, you can use whether or not you want to cover the, the closing costs as a bargaining chip when you're basically making a deal, correct? With who? No, what we're, we're, saying, is, what we're saying is we're going to have the end buyer pay for your closing costs, not the other way around. Right, right. But could you could it be the other way around if you but want to this, use that as a we'll cover our own closing costs? This is a good question. Final so if you set it up in the contract of uh, they're gonna pay for your acquisition costs and they're gonna pay for their own closing costs, are you saying can you use it as a bargaining chip that you're saying you can then come back in your negotiation and say, actually you know what, we'll go ahead and pay for our own closing costs. Right. Sure. Yeah, it's it makes sense to have as much in your I really wanted to talk more about contracts, so I didn't get to it, but uh, it makes sense to have as much as possible on your side of your contract when you give it to them and let them start marking stuff off, but have 20 things in your favor first. Um, we have custom contracts that we built about five years ago. We took the GAR contract, current, the, what the current GAR contract was then. We took the FMLS contract, which are big, meaty, 10-page contracts, and then we took 30 of our investors' contracts that we had on file, the little one, two, three pagers, and we started picking out clauses of things that were protecting our clients as a buyer for their A to B contracts, and then flipped the switch on that language for them for the B to C contracts. Things like due diligence, things like earnest money. There's lots of little important things that go into that. Uh, the ability to market the property, the ability to assign the property. All of these things, we, it's, we have it in, in one language for you as your buyer, and then we have it in the exact language protecting you as a seller, not giving your buyer those rights. So those are the kinds of things that I'm saying, you get a really stiff, strong contract, and yes, you're right, then you can start pulling back from it. So, so what happens is, generally speaking, if you've got 20 terms in there that they don't like, well, you're giving up five or 10 of those terms that aren't that important as opposed to giving up purchase price. So the more things that you can give up that don't affect your price, the better. So the stronger the contracts you have, the better. Hey, I just wanted to ask you real quick if you wanted to pass out some of these real quick. Yeah. Uh, I got some people that can help out. You yeah, say a few absolutely. Words? Guys, so I have uh, my marketing folders. This has got all of our contact information in here. It's got all of our services, everything else. I brought about 40 of these. There's way more than 40 of y'all. So if y'all don't get one of these, we've also got them different fact. If you just don't want to take one and you want to tell me, give me your card, I can send it digitally also. Um, so if you want paper, we'll give you paper. If not, then we'll do it digitally. And hey, we can do one per couple if they're a couple, yeah. just one. They might they might make it through the room. I can't yep. count, but. But we're going to have Doug here help pass them out. Yeah, the stack's over there. And Barry, if you can help out. What was your question? The PowerPoint. He's at, uh, she's asking how the, uh, they get that PowerPoint. Of all the additional information you get to cover. Um, I'm gonna give everybody my email. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna give everybody my email address. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking maybe my assistants, but I'll give you mine. 
Uh, it's Craig, C-R-A-I-G, dot Halperin, H-A-L-P-E-R-I-N. You know what? Hold on. <laughs> I'll make this way easier on myself. Ah, pretty good. Um, you might have went one too far. How do I get back? I, I can get you back. I think it was on the first page, too. It was, yes. I sometimes have to exit out and relaunch it. There we go. Craig.Halprin at halprinlion.com, the longest email address. Yeah, it is. All right, so we got any, uh, a few last closing questions? And by the way, that email address goes to 30-year-old Craig up there. <laughs> this is 40-year-old Craig. That's 30-year-old Craig. I saw you had your hand up over. Did you have a question? All right, while they're passing those up, you guys get any last minute questions? Have you run into any dog Frank issues with syndication? Uh, yes, no, yeah. Have you run into any dog Frank issues with syndication of investors? He's asking if you run into dot Frank issues. Syndication. Yeah. No, we, uh, so the SEC is worse than the IRS. Um, if you are pulling money, if you are an investor and you are pulling money together, you need to talk to an SEC attorney. I am not an SEC attorney. That is a very, very, very specialized kind of law like tax law um, that all they do is SEC regs. Um, I can tell you a little bit about you know, qualified versus unqualified investors and how many people and all that, but um, rule of thumb is if you have under four, you're fine, and if you have income qualifications for your people, they want to make sure that they're experienced investors. If they're not, then you can run into a situation where it's SEC, and I'm going to be honest with you, if you start pooling and it ends up being something that is SEC qualified, it's about $75,000 of attorney's fees to get that set up. So you don't, you, you don't want to create a fund that's SEC regulated if, if he was asking about pooling money and how to avoid God frank issues and SEC issues. So talk to an SEC attorney about that was his answer. Uh, we got one here, one here. These contracts you mentioned, this, the buyer and seller contracts you mentioned that you that you created. The, the buyer and seller contracts that we created, uh, we kind of we go in maybe once every year or so, kind of update some of them. Um, I have them. If you want to email me, we'll talk. I used to charge for them, I don't now. I, I, I give them to my clients. If you want your business, yeah. it's another value added thing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, any questions over here? I saw your hand up. Sure. Do you have uh, my Lord tenant contracts? That's a great question. Um, we have a lot of landlord tenant documents. I mean, what, what specific kind of document? A lease? <laughs> we have tons of different leases. Right. They're investor friendly? That's what, uh, sure. that's what he's really getting at. Yeah. Any last requests before we wrap things up? Did everybody get a handout who wanted one? I know she had a bunch of other stuff in here. Uh, yeah, so I also have a bunch of goodies if y'all want any of this. Um, we got some phone holders, some phone wallets. I got koozies out there. I got pens. Somebody in this room, a pen testifier. <laughs> Apparently, our 20 cent pens are like the most popular pens in the city. So, if anybody would like pens, I've got some pens out there. So, yeah. what we'll do instead of handing all this out is we'll set, have uh, uh, Doug or Barry set some of this out there on the table so you can uh, gather some of them on the way out. And last thing, uh, I have cards from one of my transactional funders that gave me his business card before we came in. So if anybody wants cards for that, I can hand these out too. Yeah, transactional funding is hot. We definitely have to take one of these. Those of you at home, this is the transactional fund for Mr. Curry too. Watching this video. Oh, sorry. Will you guys enjoy this? Yeah. Yeah.
Craig's gonna watch what he says. He's a neighbor Being an attorney, he knows better. But if you guys wanna, uh, you've got his contact information. If you wanna reach out to him, if you're gonna hang around and talk to him after the sober, uh, he'll be much more than about it. So, it's not over yet. Hey, Greg, can you come over here? Sure. You want to make a closing comments real quick? I uh, just want to thank Dustin and Atlanta Bria for letting me come out and speak with all you guys. Uh, once again, my contact information is up there. If y'all need anything from me at my office, just hit me up and let me know. Let's give it up, Chris! Uh, Thank you guys for coming out. Thank you so much, man. It's a real pleasure.